Welcome everyone here to our Ask the Expert session. This is going to be a lot of fun. We have just a great group of people. This is your dream team from Concurrency. You have, uh, I'm just, uh, it's just incredible to have this level of talent on one call together. Uh, hopefully that uh, we have some really interesting questions today. I think we will. There are some questions that were actually sent in ahead of time. And uh, one of the things that we're going to ask is that uh, you ask questions and we do have a list that was submitted prior. That's great too. But uh, what we'd really like to see is for the people on the call to also put additional questions within the chat. So take the things that you're really excited about learning today, put them into the chat and uh, we'll dig into them as we uh, do in sort of an incremental basis. We'll maybe uh, prioritize a little bit behind the scenes to make sure we hit things that are across the spectrum. We have a really diverse set of team members here today, and we'll all take a second to introduce ourselves and our expertise level. So I will, uh, I'll kick off. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna start with that. Uh, one of the things we want you to be aware of is that after this is done, if you find this interesting, if you think we're experts that are helpful to you, if we're getting you somewhere on your journey, we'd love to spend more time with you. So. Uh, one offer that we're going to make to you is we'd love to spend two to four hours with you space uh, digging into a specific scenario that's tied to your question. So if you're asking something and we're starting to help you get down the road and it's something that's valuable to you, let's spend some more time together. We'd love to do it. Uh, it doesn't really have any obligation on your part apart from us getting you further down the road. We, of course, would love to work with you, but uh, we're really in a position right now in this call to make sure we help you with some questions that you have. And then we'd love to spend some more time with you coming out of that. And then one thing that we want you to also be aware of is that on February 24th, we're doing a specific deep dive on governance, which is just a topic that it seems everybody has a question on. So we will do a specific uh, governance deep dive where we focus on management, policy, uh, infrastructure as code, app as code, governance uh, imp implementations inside of one tenant, multiple tenants, multi-cloud. So we'll be going into a deep dive on that. I think that'll be super interesting. So don't miss that session as well. All right, so I am going to drop the presentation. We're going to bring this up here and let's start by introducing uh, just who we are. So I will start uh, myself. My name is Nathan Lesnowski. I'm Concurrency's Chief Technology Officer. Super nice to meet all of you. Uh, and uh, by all means, be will, uh, uh, be happy to answer questions that are on the executive side or kind of broader technology direction, org structure, uh, role playing, uh, how, how, how roles change to get into the cloud. A lot of, uh, I've spent a lot of time working with executives on what their transmit transformation looks like as an organization as they modernize their IT department and their above line services. All right, why don't we, uh, why don't we go to Chris Blackburn? Why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, Nate. Uh, Chris Blackburn, I am our capability lead on the Secure Modern Workplace team. Our specialty is in the M365 space, but also includes a lot of security when it comes to your endpoints and then starting to extend that in the cloud as we talk about things like Azure Active Directory, uh, Defender products, etc. I'll hand it over to the win. I should double, you know, stop double muting myself. Hi everyone, my name is Lowen Mong. I am also the capability lead in this particular case over uh, uh, the apps and products of, uh, products, as well as a uh, principal architect here at Concurrency. I'm also a Microsoft MVP, so I'm everything with Nate as well. In my case, a uh, particular area of expertise is going to be under AppDev, uh, typically under client development or Windows development. However, that you know pretty much takes anything from client side apps all the way down to cloud and beyond. I also am an area expert in the IoT and data as well a little bit, right? And then I'll actually send it to, you know, the real data guy out there on my screen will be Swami. Okay, Thanks so much, to... Ruben. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Swami Venkatesh. I am a solutions architect here at Concurrency for the data science uh, team, but I'm also, uh, as Luan mentioned, the capability lead for data and AI. So our team uh, has the necessary expertise to uh, identify where your data is, uh, architecture out the best data, modern uh, architecture that we can provide you on the cloud um, for you to be a really nimble organization. At the same time, our team also has the expertise to uh, use uh, AI uh, as an added resource for um, coming up with uh, really cool insights uh, or even automating the entire process for you uh, uh, from a business perspective. So we have the capability to do end-to-end um, -end as far as the data and AI space goes. And with that, I'll um, 
um, hand it over to uh, Brandon. It's all yours. Hey, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending where you are. So Brandon Hartman here. I'm a solutions architect with concurrency in the Wisconsin region based out of uh, I'm based out of Madison. Uh, my experience is uh, mostly in cloud and automation, so I'm always happy to talk automation workflows, infrastructure, config management, orchestration, uh, how that affects cloud journeys, on-prem journeys. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's my background. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, so two things love to have start happening here. A Amy's going to read off one of the first questions that we got from uh, some of the people as you had, uh, had signed up. And then as we're going, please put additional questions into the chat and we'd be happy to hit them as priorities allow. So go ahead, Amy, let's uh, let's hit the first question. OK, the first question is looking to understand a bit more on what modern development looks like and the API creation using Azure SQL Server source. Maybe a look at API management. OK, um, we can actually tackle it a couple of different ways. So who's who wants to do it? Uh, go go first. Then what, uh, we when you get it first? first. Yeah, I'll, I'll start from that uh, from the top down, and then we can come back and meet us halfway in the middle, right? With, with some of the security and the uh, and uh, you know uh, just sending up the services as well. And in terms of uh, you know modern data, right? Modern development. One of the things that we have to be you know mindful of is data and and where your data resides, because at the end of the day, your development you know uh, environment and your actual canvas of whatever your application is going to come out, right? It could be anything. It could be a web, it could be an uh, app, it could be a mobile app, it could be a zero UI interface, like a, a bot, for example, right? When, when you're talking to, you know, I'm not gonna say the names because it's gonna answer over there. <laughs> but the point being is that when you do any of these things, the data is highly important. And uh, when you are actually creating a, you know, uh, data, right? The way we would normally look at is, I mean, you know, it depends on your business use case, use case scenario as well. A lot of the time, if you're using a SQL as a backend, traditionally there will be some form of a you know uh, a data transmission layer that we actually you know would would take the data outside and then use that as a gateway and and put a layer of security on top, right? That will be your layer. There will be two different sets of sets of uh, security, right? One on the SQL itself, you can actually do row level you know several guidance on there, and then on top of it. At the API layer, you can put additional layer of security as well and say, hey, I can do certain things. I can change certain things, so on and so forth, right? So that not everybody have full access to this direct SQL layer, but now you're actually getting through data through a different other aggregations. In this case, you can actually separate, you know, uh, two different people, right? Two different type of use cases. One is if, if you're a data science, just most likely you actually want to get data raw directly from SQL or some other source. From an app dev and the application and consumer perspective, right? Whether if you're internal or external apps, you want to actually get the data through the API now that you are actually, you know, protected from you know internal and external users. If you look at something like this, right, a, a little solution that we created that I would normally show off would be a modular solution. Your data stays on the bottom layer, right? Any other internal apps might be underneath the API management layer because you are, you can actually, you know, while while they are managed, right, there might be other uh, I wouldn't use API management to control the internal, you know, internal business apps, right? You will have other other ways to actually, you know, get around that using things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Azure, you know, AD, so on and so forth to get the role levels uh, secured that way. API management comes in as a different layer to then expose it out to the external users. One of the things that API management is going to give you is not just the exposure of external layers, but you can also use that to actually you know, do other things like throttle control, right? And and sell data and do other things as well. Uh, as well. Like for example, if you look at weather.com and stuff like that, right? They actually use the API management system to say, hey, if you are a subscriber, you get 10,000 calls a minute, right? This is how you, you can do that kind of management on top of it as well. So I will stop there from a tech standpoint of how I would implement it. I will actually, you know, have uh, Chris or, you know, anybody else uh, chime in as well in terms of any other you know, areas they would like to cover on that particular topic. Would you say it's it's correct to say, Lewin, that one of the kind of trans, the benefits of the cloud that we're seeing um, is that as companies are starting to build these API management layers, you're bringing a greater degree of control to the data that's exposed to the application layers. 
and sure. you're using cloud centric models to be able to make that happen. You're not building necessarily the API management layer so much as you're exposing it through things like Azure API management. Correct. Yeah, so what you're doing is you're bringing the data from traditional means, right? Or in, in, uh, aggregating them into one particular areas, right? And then using API management as an additional refinement gateways, if you will, and then secure layers. Cool. Chris or, uh, or anyone else want to jump in on this one? Are we good? I think that's a good one. Yeah. yeah, let's hit that next question. OK, next question. What is the best approach in syncing databases and data between Azure and AWS? I can take that Mommy? bit. Uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, as far as um, Azure and AWS is concerned, uh, Azure has a bunch of inbuilt connectors to um, any of the AWS uh, data systems, whether it be uh, Redshift, RDS, or DynamoDB, uh, whichever one you want to look at. We have uh, direct connectors built uh, already, so it's fairly straightforward using those connectors. And what we um, have um, as the Azure Data Factory uh, to kind of connect to these uh, database sources and move uh, data over into uh, Azure. Uh, in our experience, it has been uh, fairly straightforward and an easy way, an effective way of um, carrying out data migrations uh, or syncing different uh, databases. And again, when you talk about something like uh, Azure Data Factory, it gives you the uh, added benefit of setting up uh, pipelines and pipelines can be triggered uh, on um, specific times or specific events, whichever way you want to do this uh, data syncing between uh, different sources. Um, but uh, again, just on this point, it's not only restricted to Azure and AWS, but we can move uh, data from any of the other uh, uh, systems that, that are out there, be it Oracle um, uh, or, or most of the other uh, uh, systems. Azure Data Factory has, you can also reach out uh, to uh, on-prem data sources as well uh, and have uh, data transferred um, either on a regular basis or a mass uh, migration project. So uh, again, a very, very effective uh, tool that Azure provides us. Um, and uh, yeah, any other points that you guys want to add uh, to this? Yeah, and from the other side, so from the AWS side, using AWS uh, DMS, the database migration service, there are a ton of different sources that you can add everything from on-prem SQL to SQLite or um, Azure, anything like that, where you can target or choose a source and pull it into AWS to go the opposite direction. Uh, and so from both sides, you have either the AWS or Azure native option for pulling from the other source. And so that's really helpful when you've, if you have a business reason to be multi-cloud where you're pulling between databases and pulling between clouds. Uh, so that functionality is not just one-sided pulling into Azure. All right, Amy, let's hit the next one. Okay, in order to add Windows computer to Azure and use Windows Hello, does a user or the computer have to have an E5 license? How does the lockdown and security better or differ from CompuTrace Absolute? You can jump on this one. I've not used CompuTrace, but I can tell you that from the perspective of Hello for Business, uh, what that does is it does function along the lines of certificate-based auth, similar to what you're familiar maybe in the past with smart card authentication. So it is actually tying your user account to you, something you have, whether that's uh, a PIN, whether that's biometrics. Uh, so it's something that you have along with something that's validated. So from a uh, authentication perspective, it is seen as strong auth. It is seen as uh, multi-factor authentication as well. Uh, from a licensing perspective, as long as you have the Windows Enterprise E3 or higher, that should provide you the licensing capabilities to be able uh, to do hello and, and have that in interact with Azure Active Directory. So that's where that typically that M365 E3 at a base level is something that will provide you that functionality. Uh, in terms of being able to provide 
disk based protection, usually that's combined with something like BitLocker. So BitLocker provides your disk encryption. Secure Boot hands off the encryption to Windows. And then as you get to the login screen, Windows Hello provides that strong authentication for you to be able to sign in, which is something that we're seeing with a lot of uh, organizations and their uh, cybersecurity insurance renewals. Uh, a lot of them are re requiring you to have some sort of multi-factor login at the computer and Windows Hello for business does satisfy that. I think I'd build on that by saying, you know, if if the idea of Azure AD only join is a new concept for you, there's a lot of really great resources. Maybe that's something we could talk about in a follow up for you to get exposure to that. That in and of itself is a super important topic right now, because especially with people getting to the point of deploying things like Windows 11, the, the natural deployment pattern for that is going to be Azure AD join only. Um, and migrating from what was previously Windows Active Directory join machines to maybe hybrid main join machines, to now Azure AD only join machines. That's a pretty important transition that comes along with a lot of these same statements. So something for us to, to talk about as a follow up, if that's something you're interested in learning more about. Yep. Uh, so I can talk about the second question there. So how does Azure lockdown and security differ from CompuTrace Absolute? Uh, uh, sorry, I made kind of stepped on that a bit. But so for the uh, something like CompuTrace Absolute, it's a physical module that is installed in a computer or CompuTrace itself uh, is an actual module installed on the computer that attaches uh, to TPM. And so when you have uh, computers in the computer that is guaranteed and there's nothing you can do about it while it's installed there is always that level of control you have uh you know if you flash your bios you reinstall your os you can't get rid of the computrace uh functionality and so that's a very uh, literal low level uh security module that so that very much differs from azure endpoint and any any other endpoint manager, honestly, so like ESET, Endgame, any of those endpoint managers that run at the operating system level, they might be able to manage some lower level functionality, uh, but they won't get close to what a actual BIOS module, or a uh, sorry, a hardware module can do. So when we look at Azure security, things like that, we're looking at things that we traditionally would manage with uh, group policy. We're looking at things we would manage with any other endpoint management solution. So uh, passwords, uh, file security, permissions, uh, things like that, as opposed to actual hardware level management. So hopefully that answers that question. Awesome. All right, Amy. Another new one here. How do you manage the ongoing costs with Azure effectively? You want to start that, Brandon? Yeah, I'll take first crack at that one. Uh, data, data, data. Just collecting everything you know about your environment all the time. Uh, making sure that your virtual machines are right sized and that you don't have uh, you know, a 16 core server allocated when you're, the app only ever uses and needs two at most. Uh, if you're only ever maxing out at four gigs of RAM and you have 32 assigned, then you are going to be you know, paying a whole lot extra for that. Uh, and so gathering that data through right sizing exercises, through logging and analytics, using uh, you know, your analytics workspaces, and just really having visibility into your environment and knowing uh, what you're using, that's how you keep, uh, for me, that's the first step in keeping costs down. Um, you can minimize sizes of VMs all you want, and yes, that'll keep costs down, but if you just do it willy-nilly without actually knowing your environment and what you need, then you run into performance problems. And so finding your balance there is uh, the first thing that I always uh, um, I always do when I'm taking these kinds of approaches. The other thing I would add on to that is that when you're moving to the cloud, it's, it's you know, IT used to be this thing where it's like it, you had this closet and in there went money and you'd close the door and it was just scary enough that nobody knew really wanted to poke at it or open up the door they just knew that you needed stuff so when the guy came around and said i need a new san or new hardware they're like oh i don't know anything about what that means here's some more money just keep it down to a certain level of cost and i'll just keep paying the capital outlay when you get to cloud computing people that's not good enough anymore and, and frankly it's not really good enough even for the on-premise environment anymore and what is happening is there's a very strong relationship between what you're doing in the cloud and business value. 
And the best companies are the ones that align that spend in the cloud directly to the area of the business that's spending it. They shift the costs out of the IT organization directly into the business area and have it aligned to revenue production, cost savings, whatever kind of outcome it's generating. So it's it's definitely an opportunity to bring costs directly lined up to the business results and to measure it based on that. Because sometimes you may be spending a million dollars on an application in the cloud, but you're generating you know, $30 million of revenue. So you're like, okay, it's, it's scaling linearly with the value I'm getting with it. Whereas you might have something else where like, the machine's been running for three for three years. The guy who set it up quit of 1.5 years ago. So it's just been continuing to run the cash register with nobody actually getting value from it. So that's where you know rigorous cost management governance from the COE and then awareness and, and it actually impacting the books of the individual business units is pretty critical. Yeah, to tack it on, right? I mean, when you're looking at this, Azure also have a lot of charts and graphs that allows you to actually allow, you know, to 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 visualize all of this, not just from a, uh, you know, uh, a, a SQL server sitting on there or a VM, right? It's actually you can get it to a particular service, and if you as a developer, right, as a as a uh, as a as the person who's deploying these solutions, right? You can also do it in such a way that, hey, I want to actually ramp things up and ramp things down as, you know, as as as, as on demand as well. You can actually do all of those, right? That can apply to a, a you know a, a SQL Server instance all the way down to a, a you know a web service, you know, so on and so forth as well. So you can say, hey, at a particular time when I actually need it, right, right before a business starts and my, 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 you know, a bunch of people are either logging, you know, if I'm using certain things or I'm running a promotion, I want to bring this particular level up. And then when I'm done with it and, you know, you can do that manually or you can do that through code as well to, to manage all of those. That's one to keep in mind, right? The other is to use the right type of service and the right type of solutions as well, right? Sometimes we as developers and we as you know uh, solution you know experts will actually you know have a particular you know set of tools in our toolbox and we keep going to that it may not be the right tool sometimes right you got to be aware of it and azure you know is, is becoming a lot more and more diverse right like just like any other cloud solution is there are a lot of competing and and even within microsoft ecosystem similar tools for example you know how do i you know do i want to actually normalize and put my you know raw IoT data on a SQL server or I put it on a blob storage, right? Because one of them has a giant cost you know associated with it versus the speed of delivery, et cetera. Right. So all of these comes into play when you're looking at you know uh, Azure Span and how to actually minimize and litigate them from going, you know, peaking high and 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 continuing, you know, at a at a at a particular level as well. Last thing that I add on to what uh, Brandon said and, and what Luan was talking about was basically Azure Monitor um, set up alerts. How do we get the data, right? Uh, once you know your system, once you know the flow of data, when, once you know what the uh, uh, main pain points are, where you spend a lot of money, uh, think of setting up alerts. So you, you'll actually have direct visibility. As a minute crosses that, you'll get an alert by email, whichever way you want it, um, and that gives you the ability to take a look at uh, um, a, 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 any um, uh, anomalous event that has actually occurred. Yep, so. and you can set up automation, spending limits, things like that to say, yep. hey, uh, I've approved this developer, this team for you know maybe 200 or 500 uh, bucks a month or something for this dev app, and then they spun up 40 insta instances of it by accident because they had a typo. It, it'll automatically shut off, so you don't, you know, you don't have a 15 grand bill at the end of the month when you were expecting 400. So thing that automation and those uh, uh, budget limits into account are important. Exactly. All right, uh, next question. And I, I'll say, I th I think some of us are happy to stay on after the end of our uh, time slot. I think we probably could have even scheduled an hour for this. So um, I don't know if, it, for those that would have to drop, uh, that's fine. But I think some of us would be happy to stay on afterward. We're respectful of everyone's time, but I really want to make sure that that everyone who's an attendee here like leaves finding like finding they got value out of the questions that were answered. So if you have one that you're sitting here and you're like, all right, I'm ready. I want to ask my question. Like make sure you put that out there and let's let's get it answered. So that way you feel really, really satisfied with the kind of the, the information that you got and you get and you're leaving with what you need. All right, Amy, hit the next one. Okay. 
I am using AWS currently. Why should I consider a move to Azure? Ha. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna I'll, be bold. I'll be bold on this yeah. for a second, and then you guys can, you guys can yeah. uh, maybe debold me. Um, I think there's a couple different responses on this. One is I think every company eventually is going to have a degree of multi-cloudness to them. Um, even the companies that I work with that are, you know, say 99% Azure, they've got some Oracle Cloud out there. They've got some AWS. They've got some GCP. You know, it's it's going to be a thing that we're going to have some multi-cloud experience ex existence. But um, what multi-cloud usually means is that you have multiple teams. And so companies that are saying, look, I want to be multi-cloud to protect myself. Well, you, really what you're doing is you're building two teams because it's very, very difficult to build a team that's cloud centric already. It's already very difficult to do that. So it's going to be even harder to build one that has both sets of skills. Even if you're using you know, generic tools like Terraform to kind of take some of that edge off and create languages that are going to enable you to, to know to a certain degree, know less about the cloud that you're targeting and more about a common language. So I would just say that. Um, if you are fully baked in, you've done a lot of work in AWS and you've you've uh, you know built out all your virtual machines over there, I'd almost say you maybe you shouldn't even move, right? It's not like it's not like that's I'm not gonna tell you that if you deployed your entire environment in AWS, you should all of a sudden move over to Azure. That might not make a ton of sense. On the flip side, if you moved everything into Azure, probably doesn't make a lot of sense to move everything to AWS because you probably built up built up all your skills on it. But what you might find is that there's a unique capability in one of these clouds that is something that's differentiating. A lot of times we find that the Azure space is, uh, is you know, people have deployed some virtual machines into AWS and they're happy with that for that function. Um, Azure would do just as good of a job, but maybe they have like 500 virtual machines out there, thousands of virtual machines. Data seems to be a big differentiator. I'm seeing that when people are looking at the data state, it tends to be Azure Synapse or Snowflake. And one of those two tends to be the pick and they're both very capable platforms, it tends to be one of those two. I don't see a lot of those competes going into the AWS space as much as I see people going, okay, yeah, this is the data scenario. Microsoft's kind of got a little bit of a leg up on the AI side, um, let's look there. Another space I see people doing a lot of work in Azure in is just the modern development ecosystem, especially when it flows into some of the things that the identity space is handling. Even companies that are like 100% AWS, I see them using Azure AD for their identity platform. So they're getting these positions where like they're spanning Azure AD into the AWS cloud environment and needing to, to navigate that delineation. So there's, there's definitely reasons why even if you were fairly built, bought in already to AWS, you start dipping your toe in the water into Azure because it's simply, you know, a better platform in some of these use cases. Um, what about you guys? Do you have any other takes on that? Yeah, yeah. So to to add on to that, um, I might be uh, someone might pull out pitchforks at me for this, but in my mind, I generally categorize AWS and Azure into two different business needs. Uh, if you need very strong functionality for developers, where your developers can go and deploy. Uh, code very rapidly in a very modern bleeding edge shiny toy environment that's where i see a lot of aws use on the flip side for businesses that need strong business value things like integration with the rest of their microsoft stack with o365 teams more of that business continuity and collaboration functionality azure excels there and uh, so to nathan's point not uh, there there are customers where i've gone in and i've said hey you're what you're doing in aws you can't do in azure you literally cannot do that functionality and vice versa um so for really bleeding edge and cutting edge teams that want the latest especially if you're a linux focused shop uh aws is fantastic there but if you're looking for to solve business needs provide business outcomes enable collaboration that's where Azure tends to have the the uh, strong suit, so as we see with companies that exist in AWS primarily, but use Azure AD for authentication, things like that. You know, I have, I would say there are portions of that I would fully agree with, right? And then there are things that I would be like, yeah, you know, as as a developer, I can do it equally in in, in Linux in in both, right? As a matter of fact, machine I'm on is a Mac, and I most of the you know uh, code happens in. Funny enough, lately, right on on my on my uh, Linux uh, shell, that happens 
you know that span across both Windows and Linux for me and and the VMs that run that, that I'm running you know personally. That said, yes, you're right, right in terms of moving things around. And one of the things that we are looking into is now in this multi-cloud, multi, you know, uh, uh, OS environments, right? That we we are now in. Language of choice is no longer an issue. Neither is a VM of choice, right? They, they they exist everywhere. It's a matter of whether you know if your guy that you're hiring is going to be better off, and what what your team preferences are. Apart from one thing, right? Actually, uh, you know, one thing is that. Backing, you know, backup is you know nice to have, right? In case once one region of Azure go down or one you know AWS go down, I mean those things happen. It happens very rarely, but it happens. It may not be necessarily a good reason to go buy another chunk of the same you know duplicated services on on a different cloud for that reason. But people will start, you know, I, I'm seeing that a lot of people are actually looking into different options for at least a you know backup services to 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 exist on a different competing cloud platforms. I've seen that happening. And this, the last statement I'm going to make, and you know, there is no proof of that whatsoever, right? It's my data, and when I'm looking at my data, guess what? You know, Amazon does as well, right? They are typically a competing business, right? I, I you know, so I'm going to have a very hard time convincing a, you know, uh, a business user to say, hey, you know what? You know, why don't you actually go put your data in the same business that may or may not be able to get access to your data? Again, there That's is no proof at all whatsoever. That is a huge right? point. One last thing that I'll add from a data AI perspective, uh, at least what we have seen, and this is we've done this for uh, a client of ours, um, is if you want to empower uh, like citizen data scientists, right? Uh, normal people who don't have all the expertise in data science, but would still love to kind of go in and, and create their own models. Azure really gives um, the necessary background and makes it easy enough for people to actually go in and drag and drop different uh, uh, um, uh, you know, modules, if you may, right? And then um, create your own model. So with that aspect, I definitely see that there's a lot of value in um, going for Azure rather than any of the other cloud services. But again, um, as everybody said, uh, the choice is yours uh, for your end user, what they want. Okay, continuing to go maybe a little late here. Uh, Amy, what's the next question? Um, how do I get the CFO, CEO, business owners to see value in moving to the cloud? Ooh, that's a good one. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in on this just because I've, I've been a part of those conversations. I know a number of the colleagues here on the call too, and, and part of that is really to do an economic assessment, is to look at what are you actually spending today? What are you spending on you know, multiple services that once you sit those toe to toe with a cloud service, that not only do you eliminate a, a lot of those uh, traditional costs, but sometimes you even eliminate multiple vendors that come into the mix too. You're able to go to one vendor, one partner. You're able to simplify how you're managing the, those solutions in the cloud. And you, at that point, then start to expand the breadth of access to expertise like a concurrency, you know, like uh, other PFEs that you might look to bring on board. Um, you know, any sort of uh, full-time employees that uh, have expertise in Azure or the cloud, you start to tap into a larger pool of knowledge that uh, you're able to work not only within your, uh, you know, we see it with concurrency, finding resources that are maybe nation, nationwide or globally to be able to help you manage those environments. So there's there's not only the hard costs that you spend from a dollar perspective, but there's also a lot of those soft costs behind the scenes that you get from consolidating to a single platform and, and being able to uh, broaden the width of who you can tap into for experts. Hey Nathan, can you go down a few slides? Uh, I believe there is a uh, slide regarding exactly the similar question, right, that we could answer with that. One of the other things that I do want to point out is that when you move to, uh, you know, to a solution like, um, you know, uh, cloud, right, one of the things that you're going to stop spending is going to be actually uh, something like uh, scaling to the cloud, right? Uh, what, what, what's going to happen is you are looking at, you're empowering your current workforce and you actually go to scale at a different scale that you can actually ever think of, right? You can only scale at the speed of your rack in your, in your on-prem server, right? 
So the, there are two things that comes along with it. One of them is going to be how you structure your cost and how you write off these particular expenses, right? If you're buying, you know, servers and, and sands and so on and so forth, you're going to write off a particular way versus a, you know, if you're if you're moving your services to the cloud, because now actually it's become a, you know, a monthly expense versus a different type of write off. That said, one thing you're going to get out of, right, uh, uh, you know, cloud solutions is that a security and trust, right? The biggest thing I can I can talk about is that hey, if you if if it is a server or yours, you have to patch your own server. You are on your own, right? If there is any any zero day malware, et cetera, you got to you got to fix it yourself. Whereas traditionally, anything on the cloud, right? Microsoft or any other cloud partner will you know cloud provider will fix those for you, right? Information is right there at the fingertip. How you spend, how much you're spending, et cetera, is all there for you, right? Additionally, you're empowering your current workforce by that. Yeah, there are going to be, you know, guys and girls that are out there who are actually maintaining your servers for you. Guess what? You don't going to get rid of them. These people have a lot of assets and knowledge on how these are, you know, how, how your business has been running. Take them, retool them, retrain them to cloud, and they're going to be a better employer uh, for you and actually going to make your make make them grow up a lot, a lot quicker as well. Right. So that's, you know, that, that's how I would actually, you know, uh, convince as well. Anyone else? Yeah, so. Um... Similar, a similar approach there as far as empowering the current workforce. When you are leveraging Azure or honestly AWS for that matter, when you're leveraging cloud technologies, when you're leveraging uh, new technologies of any sort, uh, containers, any modern orchestration, config management, you attract better talent because you're attracting people who know the newest, uh, the newest technology, the newest methodology strategies, and you're just going to get better talent for your workforce, which makes your workforce happier, which makes the business more successful, which makes you accelerate faster, uh, and that provides a lot of value to leadership, right? And so we should always think about this not just as how do we make the CEO happy and how do we make the CTO happy and CIO, how do we make the employees happy and to make the company successful? Yeah, I, I think about it in, in maybe two different ways. One is which, how do I best enable my business to be able to accelerate the revenue and operational savings that technology provides? And be below the line, so that'd be the above the line. And then below the line is, how do I support that need with the most relevant and supportable capability? So above the line, what we're finding is that by leveraging cloud computing, we can accelerate the ability for us to deliver technology as a revenue producer or an operational savings platform. And that's what, you know, especially the wind and Swami are really, really engaged in is where can I use technology to be the fabric of my business and how I deliver my core product to my customers. And the cloud is simply more capable at doing that and has so much more commodity in bringing that to the table, whether it's in the AI space or the platform development space or the iterative delivery of capabilities. So that just in and of itself is the only place I'd be building applications right now. Below the line, I think about it almost like I think about COBOL. Like if you need a COBOL developer right now, like good luck, right? There's, there's a few of them out there and they're making a ton of money and they're hard to find. Same thing with those AS400 guys, I-Series, like they're just laughing it all the way to the bank right now. And they'll retire, uh, you know, in the next five years, and they'll be good. Like, hey man, I just wrote on my career doing I-Series development, like sweet. You know, but what, what you find with that is it's, I don't wanna be stuck in that position. Like, and that's exactly where the on-premise data center is gonna be in a few years. Like you're gonna be getting to a position where that is gonna be the thing that is gonna be like, all right, nobody in there in no, no new consultant or engineer or person coming out of college wants to do that job anymore. You got a whole bunch of people that still have that skill and are going to do it for a while. And it's going to have a long tail. Nobody wants to do that job anymore because the normative deployment vehicle is infrastructure's code to the cloud, supporting it with governance, building up an effective plan. Same thing with the, the end user computing. Who wants to be deploying, you know, apart from the legacy people, SCCM and Windows domain join systems anymore. They don't, they, they're they interested in doing cloud-based join uh, with cloud-centric security tools. So if you want to even just support your own business and have affordable you know, capabilities to deliver and people who are excited to do it, 
you're going to start moving in this direction. You're just not going to stay on that old platform. So it's it's a very practical move beyond just the kind of, like if you think threat and opportunity, you know, the threat is nobody's going to want to do this stuff except for the people that are going to kind of straggle along. And the opportunity is if I really want to generate revenue and, op and operational savings in my business, this is where it's going to come from. So combine those two things together and it's pretty obvious choice. Um, yeah. But it's something that we can get engaged in helping you with. Yeah, and we're seeing this push even from cloud providers like Microsoft who are, uh, you know, SCCM is being rolled into Microsoft Endpoint Manager, which is on Azure. Uh, Skype for Business is being, and it was out of support as a, or sorry, end of life as of July last year, and it's out of support in two years in favor of Teams Voice, uh, which is backed on Azure. So things like that, um, we're even seeing that push where you don't, you almost don't have a choice in some areas to go uh, to stay entirely on prem anymore. All right, um, I think we're getting close to the uh, end of our time here. Well, we are over time, but we've still around. Um, there's a few people still on the call, and we're so very super excited about that. If you have, let's let's give you a second to see if you specifically have any other follow-on questions. If not, we'll wrap her up. But I want to make sure that you specifically, if you have any follow-on questions, that you have that chance. Okay, can't say I didn't ask you. So we are super thankful for you being here today um, and even for staying a little late because it must have been some interesting things you want to pay attention to. Uh, don't forget about engaging us for follow on sessions. We as a team would love to talk with you in one on one scenarios about some of the things that you're interested in. And uh, don't forget upcoming webinar on governance deep dive. This is something that's relevant to every cloud environment. Uh, there is not an environment that has gotten this completely right yet. There's a lot of good best practices here. Absolutely do not forget about that upcoming webinar. So we will uh, we will see you there. Thank you for taking the time to be part of our conversation today. We're definitely going to do another one of these. This was a lot of fun. I'll probably make it longer next time. And uh, looking forward to, uh, to have more conversations with you. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you.